Good morning, church. That is my incredibly talented wife and her mother, Amy, that's coming into play from Lincoln this morning, so we can welcome Amy, which you probably just did anyway. So yes, my mother-in-law is cooler than your mother-in-law. Would you please stand with us? We're going to begin with a reading from Psalm 34. I will begin the reading, then I will invite you to join along shortly. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. Now please read this with me. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him.
is, Father, you did not just reach down and fix me, fix someone that was broken, but you brought the dead to life. There is no good in me apart from you, and that is why we sing to no other name but Christ. So we thank you for another morning that we can gather, that we can sing together of your greatness, of your glory, and sit under the teaching of your very words. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Jill Johnson. And I'm Heidi Adams. And we would like to cordially invite all of the ladies to the Redefined event this coming Friday and Saturday. At the event, we are going to learn about lamenting and investigate why we as women pretend everything is fine. The world can be going crazy around us, and our family life could be in absolute chaos. But if you ask us, we'll say, it's fine. It's fine. Everything's good. We're just fine. Right? But we all have things going in our lives, and we're simply not just fine, are we? Now, one thing that has been really, really tough this year is that we're all dealing with the isolation and being separated from each other. Very true. We as women, as you know, we long to be together. We need to be together. We hunger for women to come alongside us to do life with. And COVID and quarantine has made that really hard this year. And we've kind of missed you. We have a lot. Feel the love. <laughs> So please join us this Friday and Saturday for fellowship, games, great speakers and panel discussions, and of course, prizes. This event is going to be COVID comfortable. We're going to do it right here in the sanctuary so everybody can spread out. We're also going to have coffee, packaged snacks, and box lunches from Jimmy John's. And you can even register for their gluten-free unwitch option if you so choose. You can. And you can register today out in the foyer, online at gifree.org under events, or even on your phone in about 40 minutes. There you go. Perfect. 40 minutes. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing you all there and, to, and getting the opportunity to catch up. And we hope that you will register soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Best ever. Thank you. Well, good morning to you. It's good to be with you. If you're uh, visiting with us, a very special welcome to you. If you're listening online, welcome as well. Uh, if all you're listening online, we encourage you. We are trying to get back together as a church family. It's been just about a year since we've, um, under these mask warrants or whatever you want to call them. It has been COVID comfortable. Um, but so if you're listening online, please come back and join us. Um, we are meant to be together face-to-face, -to -face, not uh, uh, virtually. So you'll need your Bibles. Open to uh, Philippians chapter 1. Uh, if you don't have one, you can grab it out of the pew and turn to page 1161. I'm going to read it, then we'll pray, and then we'll uh, get to work. So Philippians chapter 1, starting verses at nine, verse 19. Paul writes this, For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going on living in the body, this will be fruitful labor for me, yet what's what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, and again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning we want to... Um, Make much of you, um, glorify you, enjoy you, uh, treasure you. Father, we thank you for 
the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, um, which swung wide the door open into a, a, a relationship with you. Father, thank you for your patience, your gentleness, and your kindness. Father, we so often have divided hearts. Um, we love you, and there's so many other things in the world we love that it just becomes a tangled mess, Father. And I pray that you might undo that so that we might have um, hearts that tr treasure only you. So, Father, I pray that you, be, um, that you send your spirit, work in this place, draw us to Jesus, and make us kingdom laborers. It's in his beautiful name that we pray. Amen. When we lived in Wyoming, I used to receive a magazine entitled Fast Company. I'm not sure uh, why I got it. It just kind of showed up in my mailbox. Um, now, Fast Company kind of features the movers and the shakers, the best and the brightest, the cutting edge in politics, business, and Hollywood. And so if you're creative or you're the entrepreneurial type in any of those fields, sooner or later you're going to find yourself or possibly find yourself in that magazine. One cover story was titled, Secrets of the Most Productive People. The subtitle was, From the Halls of Google and Microsoft to High-End Kitchens, Ultra-Busy Professionals, including Oprah, offer the best ways to break through all the clutter. And so let me just give you a few quotes from these, some of these highly productive people. Oprah said this, Everything in, begins and ends with stillness. A conscious awareness of my presence within the greatest presence of all, that presence, she says later, is the force I call God. Here's a secret from the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Carsetta. Schedule every minute of every day, excuse me, schedule every second of every minute of every day, but you can't let the urgent overcome the important. And then from legal officer Belinda Johnson from Airbnb, says, she says this, Rigorous prioritization. In the morning, I look at my calendar and think about whether things that aren't critical can be moved to the next week. And then finally, this is from Julie Larson, who's the chief green executive officer at Microsoft, says this. I'm a huge procrastinator and a fairly lazy person. Being lazy makes me more efficient because I try to find more ways to do the best work in the most minimal amount of time. I also I need... I also know I need pressure to perform, and procrastination is one of those levers for creating that pressure. Now, I, after reading about those four people, they're highly successful, successful, productive people on purpose. They just didn't dumb into the success. Each one of them has a compelling reason to get out of bed. Each one of them has a way to declutter so that they might not get distracted from what is most important. And I think there's kind of a universal quality that seems to be present in successful people, and that's this. They have one clear purpose in mind, one driving mission, one thing that gets them out of bed, that keeps them on track, and nothing is going to allow them to get distracted from that goal. Soren Kierkegaard, a Dutch theologian and philosopher, said long ago that the purity of heart is to will one thing. The purity of heart is the will one thing. So, what does that mean? To will one thing is have a mind that is focused on one thing to give life meaning and purpose. My experience over the years as a pastor, Christians often have divided hearts. We're passionate about many things. We're passionate about Christ, families. Wealth accumulation, work, sports teams, leisure time, friendships, Amazon, social media, technology. And these are all okay things, but oftentimes they eclipse ultimate things. I wonder what it would be like if we were uh, able to say with Paul out of Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, so that now as always... Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what was that one thing for Paul? What was purity of life? What, was, what, was able, what, what enabled Paul to declutter, to be productive? What got Paul out of bed? What was the one thing? Here it is. It's to exalt Christ in my body. 
Here's another way to say it. The sole purpose of Paul's life was to magnify, was to make much of, was to give Jesus a good reputation, was to put him on display, was to demonstrate that Jesus is great. That was Paul's one thing. It didn't matter if he was doing it living, and it didn't matter if he was doing it while he was dying. Paul it was about one thing. I am going to exalt Christ in my body. Now, I bet most of you are thinking, kind of like I do, well, that's Paul. Paul lived at a level that no one else can. He was super spiritual. He was, he was a super Christian. There's very few Pauls in the world. Maybe a Billy Graham would be in Paul's camp. That's Paul's experience. I think our thinking goes like this. If I had seen Jesus like Paul had seen Jesus, then I'd be in that special class like Paul. Now listen to me, there's, there's no such thing as special Christians. There's no such thing as super Christians. There's no special class of Christians. We all have the same spirit within us. What was true of Paul should be true of us. What was true of Paul should be true of us. We have different abilities. We have different gifts, different callings, different backgrounds. But we should be able to say with Paul, this is what makes me tick. This is what drives my life, that Christ be magnified in my life. That should be the banner that flies over all of our lives if you're a Christian. My purpose in life, my mission in life is to make Jesus look great, to give him a good reputation. And I'm going to do that whether I'm living or I'm going to do that whether I'm dying, but my job, my mission is to magnify Jesus Christ. You know, we're so often trying to figure out what, what, our, what our mission statement, there was a while, baby, back in the 90s, everybody's writing mission statements, corporate mission statement, personal mission statements, trying to figure out what their mission statement for life is. You and I as Christians don't have to figure it out. It's already been given to us. Our job as Christians is to make Christ look good, whether we're living or dying. In Piper's book, Don't Waste Your Life, he said something that has been an incredible encouraging, encouragement to me, especially in my moments of uncertainty and insecurity. So here's what Piper says. You don't have to know a lot of things to make a lasting difference in the world. But you do have to know a few great things that matter. Maybe just perhaps one, and then be willing to live for them and die for them. The people that make a durable difference in the world are not the people who have mastered many things, but who have been mastered by one great thing. If you want your life to count, if you want the ripple effect of the pebbles you drop to make waves that reach the ends of the earth and roll on to eternity, listen to this, you don't need a high IQ. You don't have to have good looks or riches. You don't have to come from a fine family or fine school. Instead, you have to have a few great, majestic, unchanging, obvious, simple, glorious things or one great, all-encompassing, all-embracing thing and be set on fire by them. That should be a great encouragement to us. You don't have to have a great IQ. You don't have to have gone to the fine schools to come from a fine family. You just got to be driven by one thing. And the ripple effect of your life will go on for eternity. And what is that one thing? For the Christian, it's this, to make Jesus look great, to magnify him, to glorify him, to make much of him. Paul said something similar in 1 Corinthians 10, 30, 10 31. He said this, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, that's a broad category. Whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. In other words, put Jesus on display. Whether you're eating or drinking or whatever you do, make a, give him a good reputation. Magnify Jesus. Paul said something similar in Colossians 3.17. He said, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, live your whole life to give Christ a good reputation and to spread his fame. So how do you do that? How do you magnify Christ? How do you make him look good? You can magnify things two ways. You can magnify something with a, micro, a microscope so you make tiny things look big. Or you can magnify like a telescope when great big magnificent things look as they really are. We want to magnify Christ like that. We want to show him as the great, big, beautiful, magnificent, superlative person that he is. 
So the morning, this, what I want to do is I want to I kind of think with you, how can we magnify Christ? How can you magnify Jesus in your own life? How can you make much of him? How can you give him a good reputation? We can't make him any more magnificent. We can't make him any more glorious. What we can do is we can point people to him. So how do we do that? Paul said in verse 20, there are two ways we can do it. We can magnify him by how we live, or we can magnify him by how we die. We magnify Christ by how we, how we live, or we magnify him by how we die. So, let me just kind of give us a quick review, just to get us kind of caught up. When Paul wrote this, he was in a tough spot. He's jailed. He's chained between two guards. His world has been turned upside down. He's waiting for his trial, and he's not sure if he's going to be executed. Not sure of his outcome. And so it's really staggering when you read the book of Philippians is how Paul approached all of this. It was with joy. So in verse 19, Paul says this, I will continue to rejoice. I will be full of joy. I will be joyful. Whether I'm living or I'm dying, it changes nothing. I'm happy in Christ. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So Paul is okay in his situation. He's confident that through their prayers and the Spirit of Jesus, the outcome was going to, going to be okay, no matter what he faced. Now, the commentators are unclear of what Paul means by deliverance in verse 19. What has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now, some commentators believe that deliverance means to his, his ultimate vindication in courts, which, pretty means, which means pretty soon he's going to get out of, out of jail. That's one way to understand that word deliverance. Other commentators believe he's referring to his ultimate salvation. He's confident that he's going he's to cross the finish line, finally be saved and glorified the day he sees Christ. So one speaks of immediate deliverance, the other ultimate deliverance. Now, I don't know where I stand. I'm not smart enough. There may be a mixture of both of those ideas, but here's the point. It didn't matter to Paul. It was win-win either way. He wasn't caught between a rock and a hard place. If I got to jail, I'm cool with that. If I'm going to die for Christ, hung in a noose, thrown to the lions, I'm cool with that. Doesn't matter what you do to me. I'm going to magnify Christ in my living or I'm going to magnify Christ in my dying. I don't care what you do to me. Wouldn't it be great if we had just a, a tiny bit of Paul's attitude? Paul was completely free from any concern about anyone or anything. Didn't matter to Paul. The only thing that mattered to Paul was I'm going to magnify Christ. It's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that drives my life. Remember what I read earlier. You don't have, you don't, if you want your life to count, you don't need a high IQ. You don't have to have good looks or riches or come from a fine family or a fine school. Instead, you have to be driven by a few great, majestic, unchanging, obvious, simple, glorious things or all or one great embracing thing and to be set on fire by it. That's the one thing. What is the one thing that we should be set on fire? What does it mean to be a Christian? It means this, that we magnify Christ in our life. If you want to be productive, you want your ripple effects of your life to go into eternity, just be driven by one thing. How do we do that? How do we do that? Let me just say this. It's simple, but it's not easy. Paul kept it simple. This is, I'm, 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 I'm going to exalt Christ. We have so overcomplicated our lives that we're kind of out in the ocean kind of spinning around in our own little skiffs, not knowing what direction that we need to be going. Paul said, I'm going to magnify Christ. I'm going to make him look good. I'm going to do it how I live or how I die. Don't just like the, just love the thought of that, just a simple life. Not an easy life. Remember that great line from Shawshank Redemption? Andy says this, I guess it comes down to a simple choice. You either get busy living or you get busy dying. So Christians, listen to me. We have to either get busy living or get busy dying, but it's win-win either way. 
So how do you magnify Christ? How do you make Jesus look really good? How do you give him a good reputation? I've got two answers for you. The first one's this. It's found in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In the original language, there were no verbs in verse 21. So it reads like this. Living Christ, dying gain. That's the definition of the Christian life. Living Christ, dying gain. So what does that mean? What does it mean to live Christ? How do we live Christ? I think the best way to define that, we have used the language around here, is the best way to describe to live Christ is to treasure Christ. To be satisfied in Christ. That Jesus be the true treasure of our heart. That Jesus be the all-satisfying object of our affection. Martin Lloyd-Jones, on his uh, commentary on Philippines, says this, There are certain demands I make of life. There are certain things I'm looking for. I'm looking for peace and joy. I'm looking for happiness, and Christ completely satisfies me in every respect. I have an intellect that Christ satisfies. I have feelings and desires which need satisfaction. Christ, my all in all. Every demand I make of life is fully satisfied in Christ. And then Jones goes on, and he was preaching these sermons before they became a book. He says this, I'm sorely tempted. Now, he's preaching to his congregation, I'm sorely tempted. He goes on, just to stop and ask the question over and over and over again, are you fully satisfied in Christ? Are you fully satisfied in Christ? He goes on, this is the very essence of the Christian position. The thing that makes the Christian is Christ. Christ is always central. He's everything to me, ultimate satisfaction in him. MacArthur picked up on that and said this, living Christ, life is summed up as Christ. I'm filled with Christ. I trust Christ, treasure Christ, love Christ, hope in Christ, obey Christ, fellowship with Christ. Christ alone is my inspiration, my direction, my purpose, my satisfaction, my meaning, consumed, dominated by Christ. Ray Pritchard says this, Christ is the aim of life, the solace of life, the reward of life, the essence of life, the model of our life. We live in Christ, die for Christ. Jesus is our all in all. He's the Alpha Omega, the beginning, the middle, and the end of life. That's the banner that should fall over, fly over our lives. This is not just for Paul. This is for us. This is everyday Christianity. I realize we're not there, but this is the goal. This is the end zone. This is the finish line. This is what we're after. That Christ be all in all, the true treasure of our heart, the satisfaction of our souls. Let me make it personal and you fill in the blank. To live is what? To live is money. To live is possessions. To live is a new home. To live is a new car. To live is social media, to live is sex, to live is shopping, to live is status, to live is comfort, to live is my children. The list is endless. It goes on and on and on. And every one of us could put something in the, in the blank. Everybody finishes that sentence with something. And if Christ isn't there, something else will be. Now here's the danger of being a Christian in our culture. All of us want to put Christ in the blank, but there's another blank. It's Christ plus money. We want Jesus. We want all that he brings us, but he's not enough. So we want Christ plus money, Christ plus possession, Christ plus comfort, Christ plus sex, hobby, car, whatever. All these things are okay things. They're God's gift to us. We should enjoy them, enjoy them. but they're meant to Point to Jesus, but not eclipse Jesus. All these things are like the moon. The moon, when it glows, merely reflects the brilliance of the sun. Without the moon, the moon is just a big, dark blob. The sun is what's brilliant. The sun is what is magnificent. The sun is glorious. Nothing is needed to light up the sun. It has its own inherent magnificence. Our job, our kids, our spouses, our stuff, sex, They reflect the brilliance of the sun, S-O-N. They show how good he is. They're not the sun, they're the moon. They show how great and glorious Christ is, but they're not Christ. 
Jesus is inherently magnificent on his own right. Nothing can make Christ more glorious than he is. When our stuff eclipses Jesus' beauty and magnificent, we dishonor him To live is Christ. How do we magnify Jesus to make him our all-satisfying object of our affection? That's the goal of the Christian life. This is not my bent. This is, this is what the New Testament teaches. We're after a purpose. I mean, excuse me, we're after a person. We're after a person. Let me just add one more additional thought. So to live for Christ is more than a proper attitude toward him. It's more than being satisfied in him. It's an action. To live is Christ, is to do something. Look at verse 22. Paul said this, like, if I go and live and that's great because it means fruitful ministry. In other words, if I keep on living, it's going to be a huge benefit to others. And then in verse 24, if I go and live it means I'll continue with you and your faith continue to move forward. So Paul is conflicted, verse 23. He goes, I don't know what to do. I'm torn. He's being pulled apart. I want to be with Jesus. It's far better. I want to be with Christ. I want to die to be with Christ. There's nothing wrong with wanting to die. That's the goal of the Christian life. This is just a, this is just a, 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 a holding ground. It's a temporary home. Because Paul is torn between, I, I want to die and be with Christ, but... I also want to stay because if I do stay, it'll be fruitful ministry for you. Dying to Paul was attractive, but living was more productive. Verse 24, it's more necessary for you that I remain. So Paul sets his desire aside to be with Christ so that he can continue his ministry to make Jesus look good for others. So here's what Paul's saying to the people he loved. I'm all about you. I love what Jesus loves. Jesus loves lost people and Jesus loves the church. I want you to love lost people. I want you to love the church. And I'm happy to stick around that you might experience both. And I want those that yet to experience Christ so I can stick around and continue to preach to them. I'm going to do everything I can to make Jesus look great in the church, and I'm going to do everything I can to make Jesus look great outside the church. Isn't that exactly what Jesus meant when he said the most important thing that we can do, the summary of this entire book was in Matthew 22, here's the one thing you guys can do. Love God, heart, soul, strength, and mind. In other words, to treasure Jesus. Treasure all that that God is in the person of Jesus. And then he said, what's the second thing? To love people. What's the most loving thing we can do for a person? Is point them towards Jesus. Give them Jesus. That's what they need. That's what they're made for. That's why they were created. So how do we magnify Christ? First, by living Christ, treasuring Christ. And here's the second thing. We magnify Christ when dying is seen as gain. Verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now think about it. How can death be gain for anyone? For the non-Christian, death is lost. It's tragic. For the non-Christian, death is terrifying. It's uncertain. It's to be avoided at all costs. You know, nothing gives me greater joy than to do a sermon, do a sermon, excuse me, do a funeral for somebody that I know loves the Lord. Because it's easy. It's easy. We're letting them go. We're letting them be with Christ. Nothing is harder as a pastor than to stand at a funeral when you know that person didn't know Jesus. It breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. All you offer to them, it seems, is just platitudes. Death is terrifying for the non-Christian. For the Christian, it's gain because we leave everything behind that we don't need. It's game because we leave everything behind we don't need. No tears, no temptation, no fear, no anxiety, no world, no flesh, no devil. We're done with all of it. 
For the Christian, death is gain because we gain everything that, or we keep everything that matters. We keep our identity. We keep our personality. We keep our Christian family. We keep knowledge of all that is good. But most importantly, death is gain because we get Jesus. Verse 23, Paul says this, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. At death, there's greater fellowship with Jesus, intimacy with Jesus. Paul said this, now we see dimly, but we will see him face to face. That's the goal of the Christian life, to be with Christ and to see him as he truly is. Now it's just shadows. The Westminster uh, Larger Catechism sums up beautifully what Paul is talking about in question 86. It says this, what is the communion in glory with Christ? What do the members of the invisible church enjoy immediately after death? Answer, the communion in glory with Christ in which the members of the invisible church enjoy immediately after death is that their souls are then made perfect in holiness and received into the highest heavens where they behold the face of Christ in light and glory, waiting for the full redemption of their bodies, which even in death continued united to Christ, and rest in their graves as in their beds, till at the last day they be again united to their souls. Death is gain because immediately our souls are made perfect in holiness and will be face to face with Christ. Listen, Christian, when you, when you close your eyes in the sleep of death, you immediately open them up in the face of Christ. No purgatory, no soul sleep, no hell, or no hell, and no fear. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So how do we magnify Christ? How do we make Jesus look good? How do we give him a good reputation? Here's how. You make Jesus look great when your heart is totally satisfied in him in living. And you magnify him in death by seeing death as gain. Let me close with this. I bet very few of you in here have heard of Horatio Spafford. Spafford was a prosperous lawyer, devout Christian, um, and his wife and Anna were living comfortably with their four children in Lakeview, Chicago. In 1871, the Great Chicago Fire broke out, which devastated the entire city. For the next two years, Spafford and his wife devoted their time to the welfare work amongst the refugees that were caught up in the fire. By November of 1873, Spafford needed a break and decided to join Dwight L. Moody, a friend of theirs, in Europe for vacation. Before their departure, Spafford was detained on business, and so he persuaded his wife and his four children to set off without him. En route, the steamship they were traveling on sank after colliding with another ship in mid-ocean. Of the hundreds of people lost at sea, Anna was one of 27 who survived, having been kept afloat by a piece of debris. In Chicago, in Chicago, Spafford received a tragic telegram from his wife, saved alone, children lost. It wasn't long before Spafford sent out to bring his wife back across the Atlantic. As he drew near where the ships collided, he wrote these words, I was deeply agitated, but I could not tell myself my four little girls were buried there at the bottom of the ocean. Involuntarily, I lifted my, he- my eyes to heaven Yes, I am sure they are there on high and happier far than if they were still with me. So convinced of this that I would not want for the whole world that one of my children should be given back to me. Moved by the experience, Spafford wrote this very well-known hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, which expressed his faith. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. To live Christ, to to die again. Pray with me. Father, I pray that you would give us a taste, just a taste of what it means that you'd be our all in all. So that we might hunger for more and more of it, God. 
Left to ourselves, Father, we can do nothing. Without your spirit, Father, we perish. And so, Father, I pray that you would send your spirit in a powerful way to work in each one of our lives, individually and corporately. That, Father, this church in our lives would be known for one thing, that, tri- that Christ is the true treasure of our hearts. God, make it so. Father, forgive us for wasting our lives in all things trivial. Forgive us for, for um, eating at the banquet table of this world and neglecting what it means to feast at your table with Christ. Father, we love you, and it's in Jesus' beautiful name that we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we close?
And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. God bless you.